This particular talk represents something I worked on for three years in a frenzied fashion because I wanted to make sure that the Khmer Rouge, who had killed two million people in Cambodia, didn't return to power and continue killing even more. Um, this is a picture of Cambodia, which is a small country. If it were a square, it would be 250 miles on a side. That's Vietnam to the right, Thailand to the left, and Laos to the north. And those of you who saw the first talk I gave on this, on Cambodia, this is the second and last of the two. In the first talk, I showed how President Nixon's bombing of Cambodia uh, as he was exiting the Vietnamese War had the terrible effect of destabilizing Cambodia and permitting the Pol Pot Khmer Rouge to overthrow the Lan Nol government and take over the country. The Pol Pot government was the most radical communist government the world has ever seen, and they proceeded to turn everybody out of the cities and into the farms, and they began killing people especially educated people, doctors, nurses, professors, anybody who spoke a foreign language, eventually they killed two million people. Uh, so they, um, um, they, um, they wrecked the place. And um, two, after three years, the government was fal faltering. So many people had been killed. They decided to maintain the support for the government by uh, attacking the Vietnamese, which were the historic enemy, and they could say they were at war with the Vietnamese. This, they thought, would keep their government in power. So they attacked some villages on the Vietnamese border, and the Vietnamese, after trying to negotiate and asking the Chinese to intervene, decided there was nothing left to do but to invade Cambodia. They sent their army into Cambodia, and they pushed the uh, Pol Pot government out of power and pushed them into the uh, north uh, west near Thailand. So uh, this civil war, at, at this point, the United States and China um, decide, asked the United Nations not to recognize the new government which the Vietnamese had installed. After they invaded, they took some Cambodians who had defected to their uh, government uh, at the time of the attacks on the Vietnamese villages. There were some Khmer Rouge, two divisions, that by this time realized that Pol Pot was killing everyone, and they asked the Vietnamese for sanctuary. They crossed the border into Vietnam, and they were trained by the Vietnamese. And when the Vietnamese entered the country, these friendly Cambodians, they put in power. They were former Khmer Rouge, but they were more intelligent than many of the others. They had been in the eastern zone. And of course, the Khmer Rouge at that time was allied with Prince Sihanouk, who was the royalist faction. So a lot of these people, uh, like the leaders of these defecting Khmer Rouge, they had entered the Khmer Rouge at the request of their prince, Prince Sihanouk. So um, the Vietnamese installed this government of Cambodians but the United States at that time was very anti-Vietnamese and very anti-communist. And the Chinese were against the Khmer Rouge because they were against the Vietnamese. And they wanted to support any government hostile to the Vietnamese on the other side of Vietnam. You see China is on this side and Cambodia is on this side of Vietnam. The Vietnamese and the Chinese have been fighting for a thousand years. And the Chinese felt comfortable supporting the communists in Cambodia. And Pol Pot had in fact been trained in Maoist China as a revolutionary to be sent out into the world to try to persuade other countries to become communists, to be revolutionaries. So the Chinese were angry at the Vietnamese for throwing out the Pol Pot government. And the United States and China agreed to let's continue to recognize the Pol Pot government even though they had killed two million people. They had committed the crime of genocide. But the United States and China persuaded the entire United Nations not to recognize them. 
And for the next dozen years, if you went to the United Nations and you wanted to talk to the Cambodian government, it would be the Pol Pot people in the embassy in New York. But in fact, Pol Pot was far off in the jungle because the Vietnamese had thrown him out of power. So this was a really weird situation and very bad for the Cambodian people because if you weren't recognized by the United Nations, you couldn't get international UN aid. So after suffering the loss of two million people, the uh, Cambodians were kept in isolation by the United States and China. Now when I returned from my first visit to uh, uh, Cambodia, about the day I returned, Congressman Solars on the left had started advocating giving arms to the insurgents in Cambodia. There were now three factions in Cambodia fighting against the Hun Sen government. Hun Sen was the name of the prime minister the, Cam the Vietnamese had installed. And there were three factions that wanted to overthrow him. There was Pol Pot, still in the jungle, wanted to get back in power. There was the royalist faction, Sihanouk, who had been allied with the Khmer Rouge originally, and he wanted to get back in power. And then there was a democratic faction, Son Sang. And these three factions were fighting in the jungle, attempting to overthrow the Hun Sen government. And Solars and the State Department wanted to send arms to the, uh, to the um, royalist faction and the democratic faction. I opposed it. I had uh, seen Hun Sen. I thought he seemed quite sensible and they were running a decent government. There was no reason to put the country through another revolution, another war. And I considered this would lead to a second Vietnamese war for the United States. We would give arms, then people would be killed, some of our tra arms trainers, we'd be drawn into the war again. I was completely against it, and I decided to oppose it, but Solars wouldn't talk to me, even on programs where we were debating. So I went to Senator Alan Cranston, Cranston and Solars had similar roles. Solars was in charge of the subcommittee on Asia of the House of Representatives, so he dominated the policy towards Asia of the House of Representatives. Nobody else traveled in the House of Representatives and nobody else cared about Cambodia. Alan Cranston was on the Foreign Relations Committee in the Senate. He was in charge, the chairman of the, of the uh, Asian subcommittee. So I went to see Alan Cranston and I appealed to him to hold hearings. And he held hearings, and I did a great deal of lobbying, which you, those of you who saw the first talk on Cambodia may remember. As a result of this, we stopped the, the military aid. 33 senators opposed it, including Senator Byrd, who was chairman of the Appropriations Committee, which meant no money would be given for this. So the State Department threw in the towel. Now this was my first success in this uh, matter, but this was from the first talk. I'm now going to give uh, three efforts I made to end the civil war itself because the insurgents were still fighting. And these three efforts, the first one I thought would stop the civil war in its tracks, but it didn't. Then I made two other efforts which were more successful. You can learn a lot about how government and diplomacy work from these efforts. First of all, I knew I couldn't do all this by myself. And 12 years before, I had befriended Bill Colby, the former director of the Central Intelligence Agency, after he retired, and I had alerted the Senate to the fact that he was a dove on disarmament, and he had started a second career after he and I testified before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee on disarmament. So we were friends, but I hadn't had too much to do with him for a dozen years. When I came back from Cambodia, I asked him if he would help me, and we had lunch. He said, you know, I'm a hawk on Vietnam. In fact, he'd been head of Project Phoenix, which had tortured 26,000 Vietnamese Viet Cong to try to win the war. And he was still writing books saying we could have won the war. But he said, I don't think that would interfere with my helping you in Cambodia. I said, great. So we began writing articles. And the first one we wrote went into the International Herald Tribune. I was in Moscow after that on an arms control school that the Russians and the Americans were trying to run together. And I decided to go, see, go to Thailand and see what was happening on the war from the back side of it, where the guerrillas were. So I made a mistake that you should never make. I got on Aeroflot, a very bad airline, which stopped every two hours. 
flying from way up in the corner there all the way down here to Bangkok. Stopped every two hours. It went to Tashkent, Bombay, Karachi, Hanoi, Bangkok, and then Bangkok. In Hanoi, the head of the scientific establishment in Vietnam got on the plane to talk to me while it was refueling. I had, um, I had met him on my uh, first trip to Cambodia. And I got to Bangkok and I went to see the Australian ambassador. Australia is a great moral force in Asia and their views on things often very similar to mine. And I uh, realized the Australian ambassador had read my article in the International Herald Tribune that Colby and I had written. So he considered me a player in all this and we had a very friendly talk. So I started looking around. I realized that, th that Thailand was run by generals. It had a king, of course, but it was run by generals. And the generals were supporting the Khmer Rouge. The Chinese were giving their arms to the Thai generals and the Thai generals were going into the jungle and giving them to the Khmer Rouge. And they were telling me things like, oh, don't worry, the Khmer Rouge, they've changed their mind about things. They're not going to make those mistakes they made before. And I thought, lots of, lots of luck about that. And the general started saying, Stone is inflexible. He has given his views on everything at every stop. They expected people to shut up in Thailand. But the great success I had was I looked around for somebody who knew what was going on, and I found the greatest expert on the Khmer Rouge and on the fighting. It was Nate Thayer. He was a journalist, and he was living right on the border between Thailand and, uh, and Cambodia. And he was very brave, courageous, and tough. And he was going into the jungle and interviewing the Khmer Rouge and talking to everybody he could. Even a bomb that went off and blew off part of his pelvis didn't stop him. He kept going. And uh, he knew everything. And he told me something that was quite alarming. You see, the Vietnamese invasion had been 10 years before. And the Vietnamese at the time I was there had decided enough's enough. We can't spend any more money on Cambodia. We've got to uh, start withdrawing and we've got to turn this over to the Cambodians. It was exactly the problem we have in Afghanistan, you know. At what point will the Afghan forces be strong enough so we can withdraw without losing what we've achieved? And uh, what Nate told me was that as the Vietnamese had begun to withdraw, the Khmer Rouge had won every battle they had gone into because without the Vietnamese who were trained, hardened forces, who were trained in the Vietnamese war, the Cambodian forces were nothing. So I was very alarmed because I could see, I could taste that the Vietnamese army might withdraw and the Khmer Rouge might take the country over again. So I asked Nate, Nate, if I paid you a retainer, could you send me dispatches from time to time that I could print in my newsletter or otherwise use? And he said, okay, if you make it anonymous, because if the Thai generals realize that I'm sending this stuff out here, they'll throw me out of Thailand and I won't be able to continue my work. So I said, okay, send it anonymous. I don't care. So I was very pleased to meet him. Now, the State Department at this time was refusing to admit that the Khmer Rouge had committed genocide. And uh, one reason was that they had protested the Vietnamese invasion of Cambodia. They had helped with the Chinese to put Cambodia in isolation. They were trying to stop the Vietnamese government from being installed. And if it were admitted that the Khmer Rouge were guilty of genocide, which was a crime, a crime to which the State Department had s signed on to when it signed a sig as a signatory to the resolution against genocide of the United Nations. So if they had admitted this, it would justify the Vietnamese invasion of Cambodia and you couldn't continue to oppose it. So, uh, so they were refusing to point out, admit, that the Khmer Rouge were guilty of genocide. And as you will see, they were doing even worse things, which we'll come to shortly. We'll see shortly that they were indirectly supporting the Khmer Rouge. And this was a really serious matter, which I'll come to soon. So I began organizing whatever people I could find to try to change the policy. I thought Colby and I can't do it by ourselves. There was a group called Corker, the campaign to oppose the return of the Khmer Rouge. And I gave them space in one of my buildings. I was running the Federation of American Scientists. We had some extra space. I said they could have free rent. 
Then I found another person who was under attack by Solars, who was an expert on Cambodia. I gave him space. Then I found this man, Chang Song. Chang Song, under the previous government in Cambodia, the Lan Nol government that had been overthrown by Pol Pot, he was the press attaché, the press minister. So, and he was down on his luck, and I let him live in the building. And uh, then I interested Michael Horowitz, who was his lawyer. Horowitz was a Reagan administration official. And I, and I interested Muskie. As I showed in the last talk, I got Muskie to go to Hanoi to look into what was going on. So I had this small gang, and that's all there was. It was trying to change the policy on Cambodia. Uh, but it was something. Now this, is the, uh, this was my staff at the Federation of American Scientists. That's me in the middle. And this was the small group I led. And they're building on Capitol Hill, about 100 yards from the Senate. We went back and forth every day. They were working on different things, space, disarmament, environment, things like that. I held a press conference. Only one reporter came, but he was the AP correspondent. When the AP correspondent writes something, it goes all over the world. It's the Associated Press. It gets into all the papers. And I said, the Bush administration is violating the law by providing military supplies and advisors to allies of the Khmer Rouge, that is, to the Democratic faction and to the uh, Royalist faction. Because the law said that Congress had passed a law, no aid that would have the effect of promoting directly or indirectly the capacity of the Khmer Rouge to conduct military operations shall be given. And they were uh, giving aid that was indirectly helping the Khmer Rouge conduct military operations because they were helping the other two factions. It was worse than that, actually. We'll get to that. And the State Department's response was, well, they don't fight in coordination which was a lie, and they knew it was a lie. That is, the U.S. government knew it was a lie because, in fact, the CIA was organizing the coordination. So, uh, but Sinuk denied it. This press release went around the world. I was at least getting responses from Asia, from Prince Sinuk. Again, I felt at least I'm being heard. And I released another document, a dozen anomalies in U.S. policy towards Cambodia. Solars held hearings. Colby and I then published an article saying Thailand could become the key to all this. If Thailand would just cut off the aid, we could stop the Khmer Rouge right there because they're getting their aid through Thailand. That's what I had learned. So uh, Solars began to hold hearings to try to deny the Colby Stone article. But Solars was the kind of guy that didn't invite me to testify. So he just lambasted our article but he didn't say both sides should be heard. Then Nate, Nate Thayer, this is the picture I took of him myself, sent me a scoop, a real scoop. It blew my mind. He knew everything. He said, there was a joint military command of the three groups, these three factions, that made requests for material through the Thai land, uh, through the Thai uh, government and through the CIA. They reported to a Cambodian working group that was composed of CIA operatives from the U.S. Embassy in Bangkok and Singapore and from the Thai Malaysian uh, governments. They approved battle plans, specific weapons, dispersing cash, and maybe, Nate thought, even intelligence from U.S. reconnaissance satellites. So the United States was up to it, up to here. In fact, I had learned on my first trip to Cambodia that the CIA had forced these three factions to work together. It was the last thing they wanted to do because everyone hated the Khmer Rouge. But the CIA was determined to overthrow Hun Sen and said, all you guys work together or we don't help you. They had a lot of influence. So they were running the whole thing. And this Cambodian working group had all these governments involved, very conservative Asian governments that were anti-Vietnamese. In fact, uh, Nate said there was a Thai intelligence entity called 838, was an elite key part of the whole infrastructure. So Nate had, had the goods on everything. And the question was what to do with this. I decided to try to publish it as an op-ed in the New York Times op-ed page. I thought this would end the war. <clears throat> I felt a little bit like Dan Ellsberg thought the Pentagon Papers, if released, would end the war. And uh, so I sent it to the New York Times. I made a few changes in it, not much, but 
uh, I didn't put Nate's name on it because he didn't want that. And I didn't put anonymous because they'd immediately figure out who it was. So I have to report, I put my own name on it, although this was plagiarism, but I was trying to end the war. So uh, the guy running the op-ed page was a friend of mine, Les Gelb. He had been a high official in the State Department. He called me up and he said, Jeremy, I've checked with the State Department and uh, guys I know, and I think you're right. I think all this is true, he said. But I have a problem. The New York Times tells me we have a rule. We cannot print hard news on the op-ed page. We first have to have an article about the situation in the front of the New York Times, and then I can print the op-ed. In other words, the op-ed page was supposed to be commentary, and people weren't allowed to go in and put in you know, whatever they thought was true because that would be publishing in the New York Times without it having been vetted by the editorial staff. So then a weird thing happened. They sent the material to this man, Erlinger. He was a very good reporter in Asia. I had been interviewed by him on the first trip to Cambodia. Uh, and uh, so he was asked, okay, write a story on this subject. So he was a good reporter. He knew the best expert was Nate Thayer. So he went to see Nate Thayer. He said, Nate, what about all this? Now, Nate, for reasons, I've never discussed this with Nate in the you know, 20 years since this happened, so I'm not entirely sure what Nate said to Erlinger, but I think he, he, he played it down, either because he was in favor of overthrowing the Hun Sen government, which raises the question of why did he send me the piece in the first place, or because he didn't want my scoop to be interfered with by Erlinger or something or other. But in any case, what the New York Times did was rather dreadful. One guy on the op-ed page called me and he said, Jeremy, what they are doing to your article. And I thought, wow, what are they doing? And then I learned that the article by Erlinger was reported on page 10, that's buried, and it said new details on aid to the non-communist factions, which, you know, really undermined the whole thing. And meanwhile, two days before, they'd given part of this story to another reporter I knew named Pear, and he had interviewed the intelligence committees and written a story saying intelligence committees are trying to stop the CIA funding of the war. So by the time my piece arose, it wasn't a bombshell. It had been undermined in various ways, but still it was published. I asked Les Gelb, well, is this going to, you know, is this going to have any effect in Washington? And he said, listen, Jeremy, Washington is brain dead. They're not going to pay any attention to this. And he was completely right. At the State Department briefing, the day my op-ed came out, one reporter said, got anything he said to the State Department briefer on these articles in the New York Times on Cambodia? State Department briefer said, no. Reporter went away and nothing happened. So this was my first effort. I realized in retrospect, if I'd given all this stuff that uh, Nate had given me to a reporter on the Times or the Post, they would have written it up themselves and the Times and the Post would have, you know, played it really big and, you know, it might have been a front page story. It would have had much more effect. So uh, live and learn. There's a lot of randomness in Washington. So I continued struggling on this and I began playing the moral card. Now this person on the left is a wonderful man named Lemkin. Lemkin walked the halls of the United Nations for many years talking about genocide and saying genocide should be made a crime. And he told all these governments, pass a resolution making genocide a crime. Genocide was the deliberate and systematic destruction in whole or part of an ethnic group, a racial group, a religious or national group. And he turned it into a crime because after 10 years of walking the corridors, he got the United Nations to pass this resolution, which is why you know the word genocide. I mean, he invented it, and he got this turned into a crime. So I wrote a memorandum, which I released to the press, saying the people implementing the U.S. policy on Cambodia were complicitous in a crime. They had, the U.S. had signed the Convention on Genocide, and uh, the American officials would be guilty of genocide if the Khmer Rouge returned because after all, they were helping and helping in genocide was violating the rules of the referendum, making genocide a crime. And then something happened by accident. I was watching television 
I saw they were talking about the Holocaust, you know, the Jews and the Holocaust. And uh, I suddenly saw something. I was about to turn it off. But I suddenly saw they were talking about Morgenthau. And Morgenthau, I had never known that, he was Jewish. He was the Secretary of the Treasury. And he was furious that the State Department was doing nothing to help the Jews in World War II in the camps, which in fact was true. And they weren't even letting Jews who got out of there immigrate to the United States. They were doing a lot of very bad things. And Morgenthau wrote a memorandum which he sent to the Secretary of State and which he gave to Roosevelt. And he said that this, in the State Department, racism, bureaucratic inertia, and geopolitics was interfering with a decent policy of helping the Jews. And I suddenly realized all three of those factors were at work in their attitude towards the Cambodians. They hated the Vietnamese in the State Department, which had just won the war. Some of the people implementing the policy were married to Vietnamese survivors and you know, the hate against the Vietnamese who'd won was high. There was a lot of inertia and there was geopolitics. So um, this article that uh, Morgan had written was called Report to the Secretary on the Acquiescence of this Government <coughs> in the Murder of the Jews. And it was written in a Talmudic way. What I mean by a Talmudic way was, it said, they have done this thing, which is a crime, this act of commission, and they have failed to do this thing, this act of omission, which is also a crime. And then they have done this thing, and they have failed to do this other thing. So it was written in a very poetic way. I copied the poetry of this, transcribed it into what was happening in Cambodia, I published it in the LA Times. Before I did that, I made seven copies of it. You know, there's was, there was seven officials in the State Department running the Cambodia. There's first the Secretary of State. Of course, he's in charge. Then there's the Assistant Secretary of State. Then there's the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State. And then there's another one. And then there's the, the person on the desk, you know. So there's seven in a row. And I walked into the State Department. <coughs> I took seven copies and I started leaving them off, starting with the Secretary of State. And by the time I got to the bottom, the phone calls were already descending and they already knew I was coming at the bottom. But I felt at least somebody, history would show, had told them this was a crime. Of course, they weren't about to respond to that. They were burying the whole thing. But when it was published in the LA Times, they had to respond. And they sent me a note that said, well, uh, the Khmer Rouge are a factor in this and they have to be dealt with effectively. Dealt with effectively. I mean, they should be opposed. What does dealt with effectively meant? They were being supported, secretly supported by the government, by the U.S. government. I, I actually gave a speech in the State Department at the Open Forum saying this is the sickest and most immoral policy the U.S. government has ever been involved in. And I wanted the people that were running the policy to hear it. But the guy in charge of the, the deputy assistant secretary, who later became ambassador to Thailand, he called a meeting at noon at the time when I was speaking so his staff couldn't come hear what I was saying so as to maintain their blindfolds on the policy as best he could. He was one of the worst offenders in this. So I made a second visit to Cambodia. I was really happy to see it was still there. I talked to Prime Minister In Tom, who had been the Prime Minister of the previous government in uh, Cambodia, the Lan Nol government that was overthrown. I didn't see Pol Pot, he was in the jungle, but I talked to his brother. It was very interesting. And I, uh, I had a very interesting experience uh, in the foreign ministry in Cambodia. I took this man with me, Gregory Stanton. Now, he was a cultural anthropologist who'd worked in Africa and in Cambodia. And he wanted to interview Khmer Rouge survivors so he could write a really good report on what exactly had happened. But we needed permission from the government. So we were sitting there in the foreign ministry trying to start a genocide witness project, which Stanton wanted. And there was a little low table in front of us. And Gregory said, <coughs> he said, uh, Jeremy, 
on this table, I was first presented with my firstborn. I said, Gregory, what on earth are you talking about? He had come to Cambodia in 1980, right after the Vietnamese invaded. You remember the Cambodians had been driven out of the cities. So in the cities, there was nothing. There were no banks, no money, no post office. You know, nothing ran. And it, and it had been like that for uh, 10 years. Everything was rotting. There was absolutely nothing. It was ground zero. And uh, somebody had had a baby and left it at the doorstep of the foreign ministry. Foreign ministry had taken it in and they'd said to themselves, what are we going to do with this baby? All of the Westerners that are here are men, with one exception. Stanton has his wife with him. Let's see if we can get Stanton to adopt the baby. And they had succeeded. So Gregory had adopted the baby. The foreign minister came out and uh, promptly said, of course, we'll give you this letter. Gregory was in very high standing there, and so was I. And uh, this was a very legitimate project. So we started this project. Then I met with the Prime Minister, Hun Sen. I didn't see Sihanouk on the right. He was fighting in the jungle with the Royalist forces. Of course, he wasn't there. The, you know, the Sihanouks, they spent most of their time in France. Uh, but uh, I talked to his cousin, Princess Lydia Siswat. And I saw a lot of people. On the way back, I went through Vietnam. That's what you do when you go to Cambodia. And I talked to the foreign minister, Win Kotak, and he was a very brilliant and witty man. And he told me something very important. He said, we knew when we began withdrawing the army that we would lose territory to these insurgent forces. We thought we'd lose 30%, but we've only lost 10% of the country. So that was very important information for me. Now, the next thing I did was uh, something which uh, may astonish you, and it certainly astonished the State Department when they heard about it. When the State Department heard about this, the Assistant Secretary of State said, Jeremy, you should be the Assistant Secretary of State. Now, the reason he said that was, even though we'd been fighting tooth and nail about the policy, was because I had learned that uh, Ho Chi Minh, the George Washington of Vietnam, their great hero, who was then dead, had communicated with the Vietnamese through poetry. Poetry. So I decided to write a poem to communicate my advice to the Vietnamese. As you know, I rarely go anywhere without giving free advice. So, uh, so I wrote this poem, and I said to my hosts in Hanoi, send me a poet who speaks English. They said, why? I said, just send the poet. So this poet arrives. And in five hours, he translated, vigorously translated this poem into Vietnamese. Now, there's a lot of soft soap in this poem. I'm afraid I'm going to read it to you. And, uh, uh, and but I, I just wanted to explain a little bit. It's, otherwise, you wouldn't catch it. Um, you have to understand that in ancient times, the Vietnamese kowtowed to the Chinese. They said, look, uh, we'll pretend you're the emperor of Vietnam as well as China, but here's some tribute, but leave us run our business as we want. And in that way, they were left to have de facto independence, but they had kowtowed. And second, you should know that uh, the Chinese were angry at the Vietnamese for ungratefulness because the, they were ungrateful because they'd gotten this aid from China and now they weren't cooperating enough with the Chinese. And of course, the Americans were very resentful that the Vietnamese had won the war. And I was trying to explain to them how they should um, do some kind of uh, psychological something to try to get these countries from being so hostile and um, do what they had done in ancient times. But I knew that um, they might have trouble with that. I quoted, I remembered Schopenhauer who said, you know, you can do what you wish, but you can't wish what you wish. So there's certain things people can't do. Uh, but I realized that the people that really cared, who were willing to forgive Vietnam, were ironically the people who had already lost limbs 
the people who had been uh, hurt in the war. Like John McCain, he was tortured in Vietnam, but he was one working for reunification and f more friendship with Vietnam. And, and Bob, Senator Bob Kerry, in a CIA operation, had lost his leg in North Vietnam, but he was eager to renew relations with Vietnam. Because these people had seen the suffering of the Vietnamese people. It wasn't an abstract thing to them, they understood it. So these people were prepared to forgive. And then I thought, well, they may not take any of this advice. So I thought, well, the main thing they ought to do is stop this socialism, which was constraining the country. They would do much better to uh, become capitalist and stop all this stuff. So, and as I said, there's a lot of soft soap in this. So it said, the Vietnamese, a great nation, trapped in a small country. Size attracts invaders. Vietnamese dare to resist. They win wars, lose friends, wonder why. In ancient times, they apologized for their courage. Today, they're too proud to lie. Not just one, but two superpowers are resentful. Ungrateful, says one, too clever, says the other. China will change before Vietnam, America will not. Find the defeated, ask their help. Psychological jujitsu is not weakness. Ask your ancestors, why not practice what you preach? Will not prosperity come faster from saving face? What emperor sulks in New Jersey? <coughs> what president saw the famous victory? In America, who lost limbs? Only those who lost care who won. Who else can forgive? With oriental care, Design a ceremony. Heal the hearts. But the personality of a nation is its fate. Do as you will, perhaps you cannot will as you will. The price of pride is patience. There is another road to both prosperity and peace. Relax rules of all kind, get rich, win friends, all at once. Only Vietnam can decide. In any case, your future is great. I read this to the Prime Minister, and uh, afterwards they said, well, we'd like to publish this, but it would make the Chinese sore. So, uh, this man, Nguyen Kotak, on my first visit told me that there was a part of Vietnam where the Chinese sold things, and that many Vietnamese liked to go there because the Chinese didn't haggle, they just set a fair price and sold it. Whereas the Vietnamese were haggling and it was very painful and difficult to buy anything. So they would go to this Cholon where they could find Chinese. He said, but unfortunately, he said, the Chinese diplomats, they don't follow this rule. He says, they set a high price and they haggle with me. He was, he was the foreign minister, so he knew that very well. Anyway, I persuaded the uh, scientific apparat in Vietnam to let me take a woman who had been hosting me to America for a year in my office to see how scientific exchange worked. And so I started the scientific exchange with Vietnam through this woman, and she had a very pleasant year in our office. I then sent a letter to the Prime Minister of China, Li Peng, saying I was going to boycott China unless they stopped, uh, unless they stopped supporting the Khmer Rouge. And he was uh, an adopted son of Zhou Enlai, very conservative and engineer. I learned later he had said, what is this all about with this letter? And started handing it out to his foreign ministry. Well, what's going on here? I don't think they fully realized the antagonism that people felt about their supporting the Khmer Rouge. So my voice was heard at a high level. And then I went to Australia in Canberra to talk to the Australians, who are a real moral voice in Australia on all manner of things and who often agreed with me. And I was going there, I was invited for a lecture, so BJ and I went together, but I seized the opportunity to go to Canberra, talk to the foreign ministry. They had been supporting a Solar's proposal, but they wanted to do what I wanted, to support Hun Sen, and it was very useful for me to take their temperature on this. But the big breakthrough for me came, now I'm leading up to my second, my, another, a success here. I was in, in Russia on some other business about disarmament, and I asked to see a high official in the foreign ministry in charge of Cambodia. And I met with this man who was basically uh, what you might call in our terms the deputy assistant secretary, which was just the right level for me. And I got him to agree to my proposal. 
I did it with an animal story. I got to tell you, in diplomacy, there's nothing as good as a good animal story. It's sort of the thing that carries the rest of the proposal with it. And I had learned this story many years ago. It's, the fact is that if you take a chicken and a piece of fence and you put food on the other side of the fence, the chicken will go peck, 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 you know, and he'll peck until he starves to death. He's very obsessed with getting food and he just stands there and pecks. If you put a dog there, the dog gets frustrated after a while, starts wandering around, discovers there's no side to the fence and walks around it and eats the food. Now at that time, the four uh, great powers involved with this, France and Britain and America and Russia, they were trying to force these four factions to work together so that there'd be an election. And every time they tried to force somebody to do something, another one would pop out, you know, and they couldn't quite get it together. So I said, look, uh, you're, you're pressing too hard like the chicken. Why don't you step back? Why don't you leave it to the Cambodian factions to work it out together? They know each other. They can do it. They can do it better than you, and you won't have all this work. And this deputy assistant secretary said immediately, great idea, he said, and we'll table the existing resolution. I said, fine by me. He said, okay, you persuade the Australians, and I'll take it up with the Chinese. So that was a very successful thing. So then I started reading translations in Phibus of what the Chinese were saying, and all of a sudden I saw that the highest Chinese in, official in charge of this, Chen Chi Chen, I'm talking to him there at a later meeting, but I didn't know him at the time. Chen Chi Chen, a brilliant man, was quoted as saying, it, the time has come to let Cambodian chefs make Cambodian cuisine. And I thought, wow, that's the way I should have explained my policy. That was perfect. You know, why were they trying to make Cambodian food? Let the Cambodians cook it up themselves. That was the Chinese view of it. And, at the, and, and just about that time, the secretary at the Australian embassy, uh, who I had given my proposal to to send to Australia, called me and said excitedly, they're taking your proposal. I said, wow, that really sounded good. And then I got a letter from Gareth Evans, the foreign minister of Australia, a wonderful person. He wrote me two months after I'd written him. He said, as you will know, since you wrote, there's been a fundamental and positive shift in the peace process. This shift has, in fact, been in the direction you suggest. So my happiness was complete. This one conversation with the Russians and me and this animal story had produced a new approach. And the Cambodians promptly worked it out themselves. And it was very useful for them to talk to each other. So peace broke out, a Supreme National Council was formed, and countries, uh, the fighting stopped, countries began to send embassies. It became okay to send embassies. And uh, so that was progress. Now, and then the State Department, which had been sitting on my request for five years, I'd asked them to let me host in Washington a Cambodian official who was the Cambodian ambassador to the Soviet Union. I'd met him there in Russia. And uh, the State Department was doing a very dishonest thing. The law says that everyone can get a visa to come to America unless they are a spy, a saboteur, or a terrorist. This man was not a spy, he was not a saboteur, he was not a terrorist. He was their best ambassador, and Russia was their biggest backer, so they'd made him ambassador to Russia. He was a very distinguished man. They finally, and I started talking to the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, and I said, you know, we're going to sue the State Department over this, and, uh, you know, you, you're, this is illegal. So they finally gave the visa. He came to Washington. He spoke at the Council on Foreign Relations, and uh, he talked to Senator Cranston, the Asia Subcommittee. One of the reasons they gave the visa was I got the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, Pell, and the chairman of the subcommittee in Asia, Cranston, to support my request. So they gave in. So he came. The important thing about his coming is the idea it gave to me to do next. I was at a meeting with Jimmy Carter in Atlanta. They were having meetings with uh, nonprofit groups, and I had a brainstorm there in mid-January. I thought, why don't I invite Hun Sen? I had already invited this man uh, before became the foreign minister. I thought, why don't I invite Hun Sen? 
And so uh, I got the same letters. I got Senator Pell to support me, the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. I got Cranston to say, yeah, if he came, I'd love to see him. And, uh, and then I wrote to Cambodia. Now, at this stage, we had an ambassador in Cambodia. It was this man Twining here, with a side view. And uh, Twining had been the lowest man on the totem pole uh, working on Cambodia. He was the desk officer in the state when I was working on this. So I sent a message to Hun Sen saying, look, I invite you to Washington. There's going to be a debate over whether the United States should put up money to support the peace process. It was $250 million. I said, if you come to Washington as my guest, I'll introduce you to everybody, and it will help the Congress pass the appropriation for the money to complete the peace process in Cambodia. So he took the letter to this man, Twining, who was then the American ambassador, and said, well, what do you think about this? And Twining thought, well, this is a good idea. So the, so the State Department wrote me, they said, okay, we'll give him the visa, and we'll give you a, a diplomatic protection, which meant a big black car to drive you around everywhere, and also to listen in on anything you should tell Hun Sen in the car, which they clearly did. Every time I told them something that was, would be startling to them, you could see them jump. <laughs> Anyway, we had nothing to hide. So, uh, so Hun Sen came. I flew to Chicago to meet his plane where it first landed, got on the plane, came towards Washington, showed him the itinerary I'd worked out, all the people he would meet. And I said, the first thing I want you to do is to present a plaque at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. And I've prepared this plaque. And uh, the plaque, I'm afraid, had another poem on it. And uh, you have to understand, to understand this poem, you have to understand that the secret efforts to defeat the Vietnamese had included uh, sending people into Cambodia. And a hundred of these people never came back. They were missing in action. And no one knew where they were. So our people who were looking for the bones of missing in action in Vietnam and also in North Korea were also looking for them in Cambodia. And you have to understand that the two million people that died in Cambodia, you know, most of them, nobody knew where they died either. They were hacked to death in the jungle, tortured to death, you know, and stuff. So on the plaque it said that Hun Sen was presenting to the hundred MIA Americans of Cambodia, the missing in action Americans of Cambodia, from the millions <coughs> of Cambodian families who also lost a relative in some Cambodian place they know not where. So I was very eager to have this plaque presented. There was one glitch. He was supposed to present the plaque right after a press conference in the National Press Club. And he left the security guards when he finished. The security guards grabbed him, you know, the diplomatic protection people grabbed him and said, come on, got to get out of here. You know, they wanted to make sure he didn't get immediately assassinated. That was their job. I was still talking to reporters. I got out to the street and discovered, my God, that security has left with Hun Sen for the next stop, and I've got the plaque. So I thought, gee, this whole caper is going to be wrecked if he arrives there empty-handed without the plaque. And uh, the, another guard gave me a cell phone, but I didn't know how to operate the cell phone at that time, so it was a real problem. I arrived at this place just in time, just as he was getting ready to move up to present the plaque. So the plaque got presented and reported on in the New York Times. And um, I was uh, passing out uh, information about him. The 1990 current biography had said about him, this is a young and gifted, though uneducated, former guerrilla who in the past decade has metamorphosized from being a diffident puppet of the Vietnamese communists, lacking even a basic understanding of world affairs, into a confident and articulate nationalist who rivals the venerable Prince Sihanouk in popularity among the seven million people of Cambodia. So this is the first time anybody in Washington had heard anything like that. And from this point on, you know, I was acting as a PR agent, introducing him to people, helping him give these speeches and so on. And uh, we rolled out the red carpet. He met Madeleine Albright, later the Secretary of State. He met Senator Bob Kerry, who, as I say, had lost a leg. In fact, Senator Bob Kerry introduced him uh, to a big meeting of the Foreign Policy Association. And he met Alan Cranston. He talked at the Council on Foreign Relations. So he, uh, he saw a lot of people. 
And he lunched with Solars, and he lunched with the Washington Post editorial board. He breakfasted with the Washington Times editorial board. And he had breakfast with George McGovern and Bill Colby. That's Colby, and that's McGovern. And, uh, and then he visited the Stones' house and a local supermarket where he saw the newest methods of tracking goods across a x-ray machine, you know, and reporting exactly what the price was. And, uh, and then we went to New York. The diplomatic security took him to New York with me. We went up in a kind of a private train car. Mrs. Clinton was in the back. Of course, this is Bush administration, but she was the wife of the former president. We visited with the UN Secretary General and went to the editorial board of the Wall Street Journal. I said, Hun Sen, you've come from the furthest, darkest reaches of the most left-wing communist group in the world to the center of capitalism, because the Wall Street Journal is the heart of capitalism. They print the numbers every day that explain to the capitalists how much money they have made today, as you all know. So he would make a little joke about that when he arrived at the editorial board. And he was cool and humorous and poised throughout all this. And uh, So what were the results? If, if I were a PR agent, I would have been paid zillions for this. The Washington Post, uh, New York Times article said, in the administration and Congress, there's an increasing sense the young prime minister has evolved into a statesman. The Washington Post said, Washington sees a new Hun Sen. Many people who've watched him develop describe him as a complicated, pragmatic, highly skilled politician who is sincere about lifting his people out of their poverty and is, like every other living Cambodian, a survivor. And a Post editorial said, the Bush administration hesitated to allow him an American forum, meaning to give him a visa. But they had finally softened their position. Well, that's, you know, what we had lobbied them to do. And uh, he left two days later, and I was able, uh, at that time, four days later, I cabled him in Paris. The House of Representatives has passed the bill for $250 million for the Cambodian peace process. So this caper of bringing Hun Sen to Washington was very successful. So that's two successes, you know, uh, that one and the one on how to negotiate the end to the peace process. So even though the first one on the op-ed in the New York Times revealing that the CIA was behind all this had sort of sputtered, these other two had worked. So then they had an election. And in the election, the royalist faction won. Ronneret, the son of the king, became first prime minister, and Hun Sen became second. Very hard to beat the royalist faction because you understand that uh, Prince Sihanouk was a god king. He became king in this. And everyone treated him in Cambodia like a king. It was just the way Kim Il-sung in North Korea was treated. They were also brainwashed. They thought he was a king. These were the last two god kings of the last 5,000 years. In ancient times, all the kings were considered sons of God, the way Christ is considered a son of God. All of them, the pharaohs, thought they were sons of God. Zeus had human children that were uh, in action, and everybody running countries like the emperor of Japan was said to be descended from God. The leaders of China were said to be the son of heaven. And uh, so it was very common to have God kings. If you were a God king, everybody voted for you because, you know, God required it. So, uh, Sihanouk, was the, the God King in, uh, so I was surprised so many people didn't vote for his royalist party, but many voted for Hun Sen. And Ranarit won by a significant, though not overwhelming majority. And Hun Sen's government complained of irregularities. Uh, later in the next election, Hun Sen won. But they formed a, a coalition government and a constitution was approved that had human rights and things like it. Of course, Cambodia is still a very primitive country and a lot of things wrong with it. But the Civil War was over, and uh, that was the end of it. So that's my report.